thank you for the invitation of the speaker. It's a, a great pleasure to be here and present to you our data. It's gonna be very different from anything you've seen before. Um, it is unique. It's what we've been developing, oh, I guess for about the past 25 years at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab at the synchrotron. It does require synchrotron radiation. And so we're doing it here at this big round building that you see um, using x-rays. So how do we do this? What's it all about? I need to tell you first a little bit about how it works so you can appreciate the kind of images you're going to see. I won't get too deep into the weeds, just uh, the basics that let you understand how we look at cells. First, what can we do with this? We're going to look at whole hydrated cells, as Nadim said, in the near native state. They will be cryo-immobilized. And we're gonna look at the natural contrast. There's no stains, no uh, enhancements. It's just the differential absorption of x-rays. <clears throat> And we get about 35 to 50 nanometer isotropic resolution, meaning that we're looking at it all the way around. There's no missing wedge as with electron tomography. And we're about 35 to 50 nanometer, which is not our limitation. We're limited by the optics. And so that is sort of a moving target. The light source is 2.4 nanometers. So maybe we can someday get at that level of resolution. And to image molecules would be correlated fluorescence and x-ray tomography. So you can see the molecule with respect to the context of the cell. So I said it's done at the synchrotron. This is the microscope itself. It's about 75 feet long. My group developed this microscope, all of it from end to end. This is the only part that the operator will see. It's this little piece in here. The rest of it is invisible. We're enclosed in a room, so you don't have to see all the tubes. A very simple microscope, really very basic. It has a light source, happens to be x-rays. It has um, a condenser, happens to be a zone plate optic. You can't reflect, you can't focus x-rays with glass or magnets. You put the specimen in the center and then it has an objective that will um, magnify the specimen, the image onto a CCD camera down here. This is about 15 feet, this whole thing here. These are the optics. And their Fresnel lenses are a nanofabricated device made out of nickel, just like a bullseye. The rings get narrower and narrower as you go out. And it's the width of that outermost zone that limits the resolution. At the same time, the better the resolution, the shallower the depth of focus. Whoops. So we use the 50 nanometer optic. That means all of the cell will be in focus with the better resolution optics, which they've looked about 10 nanometers now, only about a half a micron of the cell is in focus. So you'd have to do a lot of deconvolution approaches or other ways of manipulating the image. We're working on all of those, but right now it's just easier to use an optic that gives the whole cell in focus. So we use the 50 or 60 nanometer optics. This is the really cool part of this technique and that, that's how it makes an image, the absorption of x-rays. And what we're doing is we're imaging a region of the spectrum called the water window. And it's between the K-shell absorption edges of carbon and oxygen. What that means is all of the carbon and nitrogen in the specimen will absorb the x-rays roughly an order of magnitude more than the surrounding water because we're below that oxygen edge of water. So all of the more, uh, bioorganic material in the cell absorbs x-rays, water is not absorbed. So you get high contrast image, no ice in the way like with cryo ET. But even more exciting is the absorption is linear with thickness and concentration. So the more organic material in a voxel, the higher the absorption, the higher the contrast. And that's measurable. So if you see a change in the structure with different um, techniques, different treatments, you can tell by the linear absorption coefficient, measurable, you can get a quantitative value for that change. You can see it's directly linear. So when you look at a cell, here you can see the cell, this is an ortho slice, a virtual section through the cell. And it looks very much like what you'd see in TEM, but that contrast is just based on the amount of organic material per voxel. You can see the nucleus in the center and the heterochromatin around the periphery and a nucleolus there. Around here, you can see lipid drops. Lipids have lots and lots of carbon, so they're very highly absorbing. So you get a very high contrast image. Mitochondria, they have double membrane around them and they have a lot of cristae, which is also membrane. So you get a lot of carbon, a lot of absorption, high contrast. <clears throat> and 
And again, ER has less, is lower contrast. And you can assign a linear absorption coefficient value, which I will always flip and use LAC value, it's just easier, stands for the linear absorption coefficient of that particular voxel. Now, I should have said at the very beginning, the technology is just like doing a CT scan of your knee. Think about putting your knee in the scanner. They take an image all the way around. So we do image all the way around the cell, no missing wedge. Specimen preparation, very simple. You have the specimen growing in whatever growth medium it grows in. Get a pellet of cells, put it in, you know, put the cells in an Eppendorf, make a pellet. You can then put that pellet of cells into these glass capillaries. They're very thin walled glass capillaries. We make them ourselves. The walls of the glass are only about 100 to 200 nanometers thick, so they don't absorb a lot of x-rays. Take it to our rapid freezer. This is a homemade rapid freezer. It's automated so that you are plunging the cell into the liquid nitrogen cooled propane at a speed faster than gravity. So it's not like your average plunge freezer. We have to make it faster than that to make the whole cell well frozen. And so we go faster than gravity, to get a, a faster freeze. Completely controllable, the speed at which you freeze and everything else is completely automated. And you'll see there's a bath of liquid nitrogen down in here. And we have these little holders called pucks with multiple little holes in them. So you can freeze multiple cells. And again, the whole freezer is automated. Press the button. It will grab your specimen, rapidly freeze it, put it in that capillary, go back, get the next specimen, rapidly freeze and put it in the, in the holder. So you can freeze up to 90 some capillaries, then take them all down to the microscope for imaging or store them in liquid nitrogen until you're ready to image. And this is just a picture of the freezer. It's a little Star Wars-like, um, lots of flashing lights and noises because it is computer controlled. You have to make sure that people don't hurt themselves. There's a lot of safety devices and bells and noises and flashing lights. And that whole thing takes about 10 minutes per capillary. So it's very fast specimen preparation, fully living state. You then take them down to the X-ray microscope and a cryo transfer device put them in the x-ray microscope, push one button, and it will collect all the images from all the way around the cell, a projection image, multiple angles, between 90 to 360 images, depending on the size of the cell. The bigger the cell, the more images you need for a full tomographic reconstruction. It's all automated. Once all the data are collected, it's automatically sent up to our, our server, automatically aligned. All the images are automatically aligned with each other. You don't need any um, fiducial markers and automatically reconstructed. So within five minutes, you have full reconstruction of the cell in front of you. And you can see the entire cell, all of the ortho slices through the cell, which we're flipping through here. See the nucleus popping up, heterochromatin in the center, very highly contrasted heterochromatin and all the cytoplasmic structures around it completely automated. So within five to 10 minutes, you have your cell. That means you can get statistically significant numbers of cells. You do one after another. And also, you know, if, you, if your treatment was good, if you have a lousy looking cell, you throw the capillary away and start over, you haven't lost a week of time. This is a tedious part where you segment the structures, you manually trace them or use the lack values to get the volumes and all the other measurements you need of the structures. That's the tedious part right there. Now, what I just showed you was cells in suspension. What about adherent cells? Well, you can do adherent cells too. You take them from the flask, put them into the glass capillary. Then we put them into this little device. And there's a little, these are the capillaries sticking inside of a holder. The tip is down in these 96 well plates, the plate there, and in a growth medium so that the cells are very, maintain healthy state. You can add whatever nutrients or whatever treatment you want to the up to the back of the capillary. You can put them back in the incubator for a couple of hours so they adhere to the walls of the glass capillary. Then you just take them to the freezer. So same as everything you did before, you just have that intermediate step in here where you put them in the incubator and let them adhere to the walls of the capillary. Whoops, that's not what I wanted to happen. Try that again. There we go. And you then have a capillary full of cells adhering 
And you can see they actually form a very three-dimensional structure. You can put collagen in there. We have collagen in these capillaries. So you have a three-dimensional structure and they look very much like a fibroblast growing in tissue. And that is the fibroblast. So you get a very nice three-dimensional cell rather than adhering and forming the, art, the artificial structure of a flat cell and plastic, it's in this three-dimensional state. So that's how we do it, very simple. No single imaging technique can answer all questions. They all contribute some information. So what does X-ray uniquely contribute? How can we contribute novel information? And the one thing we have is that lack value so that we get those measurements we can give you quantitative information about the molecular composition of each voxel. And we can also do a lot of cells. So it's fast, you saw five minutes of data collection. So we can image large numbers of cells. Cells are very heterogeneous. No two cells look alike. Vast range of cell structure, even from the same capillary. And so we can look at large numbers and get statistics. Those are the two things that make it really unique. It's difficult to get statistics with EM and the linear absorption coefficient value is truly unique to this technology. It also, that linear absorption coefficient value is how we will image a lot of structures. And so it allows us to do things like segment the nucleus, we man, manually trace, and we're gonna use a, a program called AMIRA. It's a 3D visualization program. Manually trace the nucleus in multiple sections so that you can then see the entire nucleus. You can then, grab all those voxels in that, in that nucleus and plot a histogram of the nucleus overlying the, over, the cytoplasm, the whole cell. So we have a nu nucleus and it has been divided into two peaks. You can see it's a bimodal distribution of the nuclear structure. And what you see that looks like heter heterochromatin, that wasn't supposed to happen either. Okay, segment the nucleus. So what looks like heterochromatin and defined as heterochromatin in electron microscopy shows up as this peak here. It's a very highly absorbing end of the spectrum. Tightly packed chromatin, highly absorbing. So that's the heterochromatin peak. And you can by just on the screen in a mirror, adjust the histogram so that you see those heterochromatin molecules, grab all of them. And then you get the 3D distribution of heterochromatin like you see here the heterochromatin being in blue and the region euchromatin in green. And it contains the active genes plus a whole lot of other stuff. But it's a very nice way of getting a quantitative distribution to get spatial and quantitative information. You can also do things like segment the mitochondria. They have a unique linear absorption coefficient. Then you get the 3D distribution of the, the mitochondria. And once you have those segmented mitochondria, you have the volume, you have their spatial distribution, shapes, all sorts of information. And so you can compare volumes of structures after different treatments. And you can wrap it around the nucleus to see how those mitochondria are interacting with the nuclear envelope. Now, just because we were wondering what measure, what does the crowding tell us? So we're looking at heterochromatin. We see that it's higher absorption than the euchromatin. That means more crowded. How crowded is crowded? What, is it, what does that value mean? So we looked at a yeast expressing an alcohol oxidase crystal. We forced it to express that. We know the atomic composition of the crystal based on cryo-EM. So we calculated the, electron, the linear absorption coefficient based on the known concentration, how many elements are in there. And then we measured it. And it turns out that that's exactly spot on. The linear absorption coefficient is exactly what you would expect if you calculate it. So it is quantitative, but it tells you that we're less concentrated than a crystal. And sperm chromatin is the most highly compacted chromatin. And you can see that most of the cell is significantly lower compaction, less crowded than the sperm head. And if you look at it quantitatively, there's actually, if you look down here, there's a very thin blue line. That's the lipids that spread out there. So it's yeah, about as crowded as a lipid droplet, just to put it into perspective. And we've been able to identify a number of structures just based on linear absorption coefficients, as you can see here. So that helps us to segment and get some information. But what can you do with these sorts of data once you have them? 
But we decided to look at a couple of things. The first one we did was looking at olfactory uh, epithelial neuron differentiation, looking at the cells as they differentiate. And this is a project that we did in collaboration with Stavros Lovardis uh, when he was at UCSF. And he was studying olfactory receptor gene selection. And what he did know is that there are about 1,400 olfactory receptor genes in clusters across 18 mouse chromosomes. So they're, all the chromosomes have one of these genes and they cluster together. And each of the neurons expresses just one allele of one gene. So it's a highly selective process in, during differentiation. And that process all occurs during neurogenesis. And so that's what we wanted to look at, the organization of the nucleus during that process. So we got epithelium from mouse. These are all cells that we obtained from mice. And Stavros had markers for the different layers. So you can see that stem cells are at the bottom and they differentiate as they go up. And these are their epithelial cells at the top. So he has markers for each of them. We were able to get cells that we knew were at different stages of differentiation and study them. And so what we see here is those cells the nucleus on the left, you can see the, the um, organization here highlighted in red, which I think you can see, and the histogram of that nucleus. You can see there's a lot of heterochromatin around the periphery. You can see the histogram and the 3D distribution of heterochromatin and euchromatin looks fairly normal. And this is showing you the distribution of that chromatin in the outer two microns of the nucleus. I'm sorry, outer two. Yes, outer two microns of the nucleus, the euchromatin and the heterochromatin. So a lot of heterochromatin at the periphery. What you see happens during differentiation though, is that the heterochromatin starts leaving the nuclear envelope and moving towards the center of the nucleus. And you see nice mass of paracentromeric heterochromatin, which you heard about earlier, a mass of paracentromeric heterochromatin and a nucleolus at each end of that mass of uh, chromatin. You can see the change in the histogram as the cells differentiate, the change in the spatial distribution. The 3D shows very nicely that mass in the center and very little around the periphery. And you can see it when you plot it. So you get both quantitative and spatial distribution of the chromatin during differentiation. Now, one thing Stavros noted when we did this is this little blob down here at the periphery of the of paracentromeric heterochromatin. And that made him very curious for a reason that he had observed for many years and didn't really understand put in place. But that made him wonder if those were the differentiated, uh, the silenced genes. And the reason he wondered that is, is rather historical during his grad school days, but to prove it, he made a, a marker, a pan uh, OR marker that would recognize it multiple olfactory receptor genes. And with fish, it showed that indeed, there are foci around the paracentromeric heterochromatin of those silenced genes, about five or six of these foci. And it does indeed match this focus here. And then one allele will pop out of the, of the silenced genes and be the expressed allele. Stavros has done many beautiful studies to really go into the details of all those processes. But for our purposes here, we're just going to focus on this one process. What he had noticed previously that piqued his curiosity was that as the cells are differentiating, and you can see them here, this is a DAPI stain. You can see that there's a, the increasing accumulation of that paracentromeric heterochromatin in the center. So he'd always noticed that and been curious about it. And then he did a lamin B st stain and showed that epithelial cells have a periphery of lamin B as you would expect in the nucleus, but the mature cells do not. In their last cell si stage of the cell cycle, the last time they divide, the lamin B stays in the cytoplasm, leaves the nucleus, and that allows that heterochromatin to move to the center. So it's a complete structural reorganization. No lamin B, paracentromeric heterochromatin goes to the center of the nucleus and those silence genes accumulate around the periphery. What, so what he thought was, is it necessary for that lamin B to leave? Is it necessary to have that mass of paracentromeric heterochromatin? So he got a mouse where he forced it to express lamin B inappropriately in the final cell 
cycle in the final division. And what happened is that the mass of paracentomeric heterochromatin is gone. It's sort of a little bit up here, four to the side. You see a nice collection around the periphery of the heterochromatin. And indeed, all OR expression is screwed up. So you, in this particular cell line, the 3D organization of the nucleus is critically important for gene expression. You have an improper uh, organization, you screw up all gene expression. He actually has gone on to further these studies and showed that they want to isolate these cells and grow them in culture. And so he started growing them in culture. It took a lot of work. They had never been grown in culture before. He finally got it to grow in culture. But what happened then is the same thing. The entire thing flattened out, loss of the central mass of paracentromeric heterochromatin, and completely screwed up gene expression. So the 3D organization of this nucleus is critical for proper gene expression. He also knocked out HP1 beta to see what would happen. And that also is critically important for the proper gene expression. And you can see in here, the distribution of her, uh, chromatin, euchromatin and heterochromatin is completely disrupted when you knock out HP1 beta. So 3D organization is critical. We then looked at chromatin condensation during hematopoiesis, blood cell differentiation. And we started looking at uh, early development. As you know, maybe you don't, uh, blood cell has two lines from the, from the pluripotent or multipotent uh, stem cell. It can become either the red blood cell, white blood cell, or progenitor cells, actually not red, just the lymphoid or myelocyte lines. We looked at the stem cell, we looked at uh, progenitors and two differentiated cells. If you look at, we started actually with an embryonic stem cell to get sort of a baseline of what the pluripotent cell would look like. And you can see this cell has very large nucleoli. Those red structures that you saw highlighted are the nucleoli. It's a very large nucleus, very little heterochromatin around the periphery, mostly euchromatin in the center. So that's the embryonic stem cell, very large. Blood cell goes down to here and you will see a much smaller nucleus. Then we looked at the progenitors. We'll look at one progenitor, see a much smaller cell, round, much more heterochromatin in the periphery, smaller nucleoli. It's already showing signs of distinct differentiation. And then when you look at the differentiated cells, the B cell or a neutrophil, we're looking at the neutrophil here. You see a very thick band of heterochromatin around the periphery small nucleoli and a lot of euchromatin. Neutrophils are very weird though. They have a very interesting looking nucleus. If you look at the 3D organization of the nucleus, it's sort of toroidal, very unusual, unique to the neutrophil, but um, makes a very interesting looking structure. If you do the quantifi quantification of this, you can get more specifics on how the heterochromatin is changing. You can see this is a stem cell, very little heterochromatin around the periphery, much larger nucleus, predominantly euchromatin region. You're getting more and more heterochromatin around the periphery in the progenitor cells, and then in the differentiated cells, nice thick band of heterochromatin around the periphery. Again, this cells from mice, so they're not cultured cells, they're right from the mouse. And you can quantify it and see that there's a distinct increase in the heterochromatin during that differentiation decrease in the euchromatin region and a very distinct decrease in the cell volume, the nuclear volume gets smaller. It's a little bit easier to see the bands of heterochromatin here and you can plot it and you see that the band of the differentiated cells have a much thicker band of heterochromatin than does the stem cell or undifferentiated cell. And so it's, it, you get both spatial and quantified information. Now, one thing we noticed in both of these cells was we're seeing that the cells get smaller as they differentiate, but we also noticed that the euchromatin region is more directly proportional to the volume of the nucleus. In other words, as the nucleus is getting bigger, it's mostly the euchromatin region rather than heterochromatin. So you're getting more proteins, maybe more active genes 
a lot more stuff in the nucleus. So we wanted to now look at primary cells versus transformed cells. We had a lot of information about B cells from mice. So we thought we'd look at cells from mice. For the next study, let's just flip through the ortho slices of the primary B cell. You can see a large amount of heterochromatin at the periphery of the B cell nucleus. And now we're going to look at a B cell in which we've transformed it, only transformed it using the able. You're going to see a very different structure of the nucleus just based on that transformation. The nucleus is much larger, thinner band of heterochromatin around the periphery, much larger nucleoli. It's already a very different cell just from being transformed. Then we look at the lymphocytic leukemia, the same cell line, the same B cell from mice, lymphocytic leukemia, massive nucleus, almost no heterochromatin around the periphery of the nucleus, gigantic nucleoli, it's a very different cell. You can quantify it and you can see the increase in the nuclear volume from 102 cubic microns up to 450 cubic microns and the percent heterochromatin from 52% down to 22%. It's most it's a huge nucleus, but mostly the euchromatin region. And what that means is that band of heterochromatin becomes very thin around the periphery. Now, 3D organization is important. Heterochromatin at the periphery is very important. You've completely altered the organization of that heterochromatin throughout the entire cell. And again, though, with these cells, the euchromatin region is directly proportional to the volume of the euchromatin of, of the cell. So it's the bigger the nucleus, the more euchromatin region you get. And we've gone on to do other cell types. You can see that the more you get very large cell nuclei, the MDCK2 getting up to the 400 cubic micron range, very large. And with differentiation, you get a distribution, a different thickness of the heterochromatin at the periphery, the lymphocytic leukemia cell way down here compared to the primary B cells. So my theory is, and these are very crude drawings, that this is sort of what they look like. Differentiated nucleus, very round, very small, thick band of heterochromatin, both stem cells and the differentiated, de-differentiated cells, cancer cells, all look alike very thin band of heterochromatin, very large nucleus. They look alike. The nuclear organization, you, you can't tell them apart. So go back to this slide for just a minute because of the size of these things. We have looked at thousands of cultured cells in the last couple of years, literally thousands. All of the cultured cells look the same. The more cancerous they are, the more they look just like this. Very hard to tell one from another. The moral of the story, I think we need to get to more cell models, perhaps organoids. We have to start looking at more normal nuclei than what you find in a cancer cell, or even this is what, what cell lines look like. No matter what the cell line, how normal it started out, they all end up looking like this. So they become pluripotent. You know, they're not pluripotent, sorry, they, a lot of polyploidy, aneuploidy, multiple chromosomes, they are no longer normal. We need to start looking at more cell models. So leave that aside. What we wanted to do was look at a cell line, human cell line, everything we've done so far was in mice. We wanted to look at human cells, but we wanted them to be as normal as possible. So this GM line is available and they guarantee it be normal when they send you normal number of chromosomes, perfectly diploid when you get them. What you do with them over time, the more they grow in culture, the less normal they will be. So we looked at very early passage. And you can see this looks much more normal. Nice band of heterochromatin at the periphery, nice distribution of heterochromatin throughout the nuclear or uh, throughout the entire nucleus, a very nice looking healthy cell. Just look at different ortho slices throughout. Nice nucleoli, nice nuclear organization. It's a normal cell, it's much more normal. So I promote the use of uh, 
cell models and organoids and culture and biopsies, et cetera, anything a little more normal than what we get in cultured cells. They're just, what allows them to be so easily transformed, which is why people like to use them, is they're no longer normal. So that's my lesson there. But what these lack values allow us to do is things like model how molecules move to the nucleus. So this is a study done by a mathematician. We work with multiple people. And he wanted to model how a molecule would move through the chromatin based on the concentration of stuff in it. So he made a, a protein of a known size and a potential binding site and started his model. And you can see in this piece of a wedge of a nucleus, the multiple paths that it would take. And what he found was that there's an optimal crowding for molecules to move through the nucleus. So it needed to have that optimal crowding that allowed it to move through the nucleus and find its target. Another modeling based on those same B cells, these are all the same cells. This was done with Frank Albert. And what he did was take the same B cells. He did the high C studies. Then he modeled how that genetic material would have to fit into the nucleus to match the high C, high C studies. And he found one of the patterns that he saw was three clusters of centromeres based on the paracentromeric heterochromatin. And he asked us to do the SXT, the X-ray tomography of those same cells, which we did. And we were able to find that same pattern. So in this case, the high C, he, he modeled so it had to fit into that nucleus. He was able to match one of the structures that we see, the three different centromeres and the heterochromatin around it. So what we'd like to do eventually is start doing the reverse image a cell and then do the high C of that same cell. So it requires some technology to work out, but that's something we can do. So that's some modeling. The, nu the bacterial nucleoid is again, where we looked at the differences between the supercoiled domain uh, seen with a lack of 0.29 and the lower lack and how it responded to acid stress. And the SAC study they did to show how the molecule would change organization to generate the nucleoid structure that you see in the lower right in the acid stress nucleoid. Kind of a nice model, um, very simple structure, and that is the nucleoid. Chrom chromatin connectivity, what we did here was look at the distribution of heterochromatin. The old theory of islands of heterochromatin is not accurate. If you look at this movie, you can track the blue and the green and it's continuous throughout all of the nucleus. You can do a shrinkage study of the chromatin and the uh, heterochromatin will shrink down to a structure where 99% voxel connectivity. You can shrink down the euchromatin. You're basically just shrinking the size of that structure as you see it in the voxels to a minimum structure and find that it's all interconnected. That's that mass of paracentromeric heterochromatin. These are Stavros' cells and then the overlay. And so you can see that there's a chromatin network, some sort of baseline that we see in the nucleus and we see it in every nucleus. We cannot base, ba break that basic connectivity. Don't know what it is, why it's there, what purpose it has, but it's there. Membraneless organelles. I'm gonna visit Gary's favorite topic, the nucleolus. <laughs> and this is the nucleolus from the mature olfactory epithelials we saw. And it has the three structures that Gary described. You have the central structure, structure, a band around that structure, the third band out there, and then the paracentromeric heterochromatin. They are all, as he said, separated based on no membrane, but very nicely separated and distinctly seen. And then this is the 3D distribution. This is a video, the paracentromeric heterochromatin around the periphery and the three structures with that. Now, what we thought based on reasoning of crowdedness based on the lack value, but that region right there where it looks the whitest, is the lowest density. So is that where transcription occurs? That would be logic telling you that's where transcription would occur. So Stavros did the fish study to show, and this has to be a separate cell because fish is very destructive. You can't do structural studies on a fish treated cell, but taking the same stage of differentiation, you could see, oops, you could see, the um, DRNA, RRNA, sorry, in green, 
in that low transcription region, the nucleo one in that central one. So we've hypothesized that is where uh, transcription would occur. We did a transcription factor and indeed it does overlay with that region, low absorption. So, so far that seems to hold up, that's where transcription would occur. And we use that to hypothesize where transcription sites would be out in the rest of the nucleus. It all showed up in the euchromatin region. You see these little red dots, that's the nucleus bump there, nucleolus, I mean. And so we got all those low absorbing regions in that site right there. This is a different stage of that very same olfactory epithelial study that we did. This is a, a rapid, this is a differentiating cell. So it, it's a little more active than the mature one that you looked at before. And in addition to those three regions that we saw, we also see these very dense deposits moving through that outer region that Gary described where the transcripts move. Based on just pure logical reasoning of the density of those structures, that they might be the RNA transcripts. We need some direct evidence to uh, direct overlay to show that, but it, it fits with reason. Number of these deposits only in that region out there and in the differentiating cells, not the mature cell. Virus infected cells, I don't have too much time to go into it, but we're able to differentiate the capsids versus the enveloped virus on the surface, capsids in the nucleus, and some on the surface. And then I want to show you the model. All the structures we can see in the um, infected cells, virus infected cells, but I want to show you the video. This one shows how a virus particle, the capsid would move through the nucleus, a lot, another modeling experiment. And so they modeled how a thousand capsids would move for five seconds and showed that their size restricts their diffusion into heterochromatin, limits, it, limits their movement through the euchromatin region to the nuclear pores. So just with these uh, images we have, we can do modeling based on knowing the concentration of the material things are moving through. Uh, I have to flip through the SARS because I think I'm out of time. We did some SARS infected cells, uh, what we did during COVID vacation and um, <laughs> the only experiments they allowed at the synchrotron. So we looked at SARS infected cells. But one thing we found that's really interesting is that a lot of the uh, infection occurred by two cells fusing with each other and they transfer the infection via that fusion, and you end up with a binucleoid cell. So we had a lot of those double nucleus cells in these SARS infected cells. Um, quickly go through some quantitative imaging because we can look lots of cells. We looked at insulin granule secretion. You can do a bunch of manipulations and count the number of insulin granules. Lots of statistics from those cells. But another cool modeling experiment, because I think this tool is really good for cell modeling. This was based on some work done by Art Olson and David Goodson. Um, they took the proteomes from 20 known proteomes of the insulin granule itself, and they had this crystal structure of it. And so what they then did was model how those proteins, based on their crystal structure and our lack values, would fit into the insulin granules in an immature versus mature insulin granule. And you can see that the low lack cell, uh, low lack values for insulin granules correlated with their immature and the high lack correlated with the mature granule. So, I mean, this is a really, in my opinion, a really cool study combining proteomics and structural imaging because they, I mean, it wasn't trivial, but they used that proteome and the lack values and came up with a model that worked. I like it. And then just David Goodfield does all the models for cell biology textbooks. This is his model of insulin granules, immature and mature granules. Correlated imaging, just quickly, we do correlated fluorescence and X-ray tomography. This one shows the inactive X chromosome based on that H28 EGFP that preferentially binds the inactive uh, silence chromatin. And you can see that we can overlay those data from the uh, cryo fluorescence tomography and cryo X-ray tomography and get a 3D view of that chromosome based on uh, the linear absorption coefficient. You can see that there are three different degrees of compaction in that chromosome based on linear absorption coefficient. Lots of studies that could be done with that. 
We can also do correlated fluorescence, I mean, cor correlated x ray tomography in cryo ET, not the same cell, but this is an example of an insulin granule again, where we were able to count numbers of insulin granules, changes with various treatments. And with cryo ET, you can see the structure of that insulin granule. Two very compatible tools. We get to see the whole cell, do the quantitation. They get about less than 0.1% of a cell, but you can get the high resolution information and, over, and get more information from two technologies than you would get from either one alone. I'm not gonna go through automated segmentation. It's something we need to do, it's painful. Oh, got too much stuff here. Protein condensates, ending up with the Lewy body concentrate, con condensates. So we're also able to see all of these condensates, membraneless organelles, whatever. I'm starting to look at Alzheimer's condensates and Lewy body condensates. Stop there and thank all the people. Our lab here, Mark Legro is a physicist who designed and built all of our instruments. These are the people who do the work. And our wonderful collaborators who bring exciting and interesting specimens to us for imaging. And I will stop there because we've run out of minutes left for me. So. <laughs>